Kaya Chaksur Militanya Tasmai Sri Gaurave Namaha Vanchakaupata Rubyasya Kripa Sindhu Bayevacha Patitanam Pavanebyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Hatwaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare so welcome everyone to our ongoing study, Bhakti Vai Bhav, and we're on Canto 6, and tonight we're looking at Chapter 11, entitled The Transcendental Qualities of Vritasura. So you will remember yesterday we were hearing about the, the conflict between the demons and the demigods and how Indra was armed with a thunderbolt weapon which was made from the bones of Dadichi. So that thunderbolt weapon was enriched with great austerities and it was also blessed by the Supreme Lord Narayan that he had told Indra to, to try like that, to get the bones from the Dadiji and use them to make a thunderbolt weapon with the help of Vishwakarma. So the demigods were fighting the demons and the demons were throwing many different weapons and the demigods cut all the weapons to pieces. And then the demons threw the peaks of mountains and stones and trees, but the demigods cut them to pieces as well. So seeing, seeing the power of the demigods, that many of the demons on the side of Vritasura became overwhelmed with fear and they began to run away. So when Vritasura saw the, uh, the demons who were supposed to be on his side and supposed to be fighting with him, when he saw them running away, then Vritasura was laughing at their cowardice. And he was, uh, of, he, he, didn't, he didn't get angry, but he, he just laughed at them that they're, they're so weak-minded and so cowardly. He was, he was surprised that these were supposed to be great heroes in battle. But with the, the fear of death, they were running away. So we will hear in this chapter how Vritasura speaks to them. Good night. Text number one. Mm -hmm. Vritasura, the commander-in-chief of the demons, advised his lieutenants in the principles of religion. But the cowardly demoniac commanders, intent upon fleeing the battlefield, were so disturbed by fear that they could not accept his words. So Vritasura was telling the demons how it's glorious to stand and fight and to die on the battlefield is a glorious death. But these demons were so cowardly, they turned and ran away. They didn't want to hear the philosophy. They didn't want to hear the preaching of Vritasura. So text 2 and 3 describes the thinking of the demigods that the demigods, seeing how the demons were running away, they began to try to hit the demons from the back. They, they were attacking the army of the demons from the rear. 
and they were driving away at the demoniac soldiers. And so seeing the condition of the soldiers, Vritasura, who was called by the name Indrashatru, meaning the enemy of Indra, was very much aggrieved. Unable to tolerate such reverses, he stopped and forcibly rebuked the demigods, speaking the following words as if in an angry mood. Right? The demigods were breaking the religious principles because when somebody runs away from the battlefield, you're not meant to go after them and attack them and try to kill them from behind. You just let them go. Okay, they're cowards. They're, they're not showing the real courage of the Kshatriya. So they're not worth fighting with. So Vritasura, uh, Vritasura is speaking to these demigods who are not following the religious principles. And he tells them, these demoniac soldiers have taken birth uselessly. In other words, the soldiers who were on his side, they've taken birth uselessly because they were running from the battle. He said, they have come from the bodies of their mothers, just exactly like stool. What is the benefit of killing such enemies from behind while they are running in fear? One who considers himself a hero should not kill an enemy who is afraid of losing his life. Such killing is never glorious, nor can it promise one nor can it promote one to the heavenly planets. So in this way, uh, Vritasura is expressing his disgust at both the demons and the demigods, that neither of them are following properly the religious principles. The demons should not be cowardly and run away from the battle. And the demigods shouldn't go after the demons and try to attack them from behind. The demigods should just appreciate that these demons are useless people and let them go. Vridasura continues, text number five, it says, O oh, insignificant demigods. <laughs> He's not very impressed with the demigods. He calls them insignificant demigods. If you truly have faith in your heroism, if you have patience in the course of your hearts, and if you are not ambitious, for sense gratification. Please stand before me for a moment. <laughs> so, Vritasura is challenging the demigods. That if you demigods are such big heroes, you know, you're going after the demons who are running away. So, if you're such big heroes, you like to go and kill people, then come and fight with me. I'm here. You come and stand in front of me and we will do battle. So Vritasura is actually offering this opportunity to the demigods, right? And he tells them, that if you have faith in your heroism, if you have patience in the core of your heart, and if you are not ambitious for sense gratification. And so three, three things he asks from the demigods. And of course, the demigods haven't got any of these things. They, they're completely lacking. They have no faith in their own heroism. They have no patience. And they are ambitious. They want sense gratification. 
So Vidrasura is challenging them in this way. Text 6 says, Vritasura, the angry and most powerful hero, terrified the demigods with his stout and strongly built body. When he roared with a resounding voice, nearly all living entities fainted. So just imagine how powerful Vritasura was. The, the demigods are powerful, but the Vritasura is just overwhelmingly powerful. And he has such a big, strong body. And when he roars, his voice, it just terrifies people. And all, all, nearly all living entities who just faint out of fear. What is that sound? So this was Vritasura. He's very powerful. But he's a great devotee. And we will see. Text 7. When all the demigods heard Vritasura's tumultuous roar, which resembled that of a lion, they fainted and fell to the ground as if struck by thunderbolts. This was the power of Vritasura's roaring, that just by the sound which he produced, it would shatter them. And they, 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 could, they just fainted out of fear, like they were struck by thunderbolts. Sometimes we see like that, we see sometimes people are very afraid, very afraid, and they're so afraid they will just faint. It's just out of fear of what's happening. It's unbearably frightening for them. So this, even the demigods who are supposed to be very brave, and they're supposed to be heroes, but just that sound from Vritasura was enough to terrify them. And so much so that they would drop, they would faint, they would just become unconscious. So text 8 goes on. The demigods closed their eyes in fear. Vritasura, taking up his trident and making the earth tremble with his great strength, trampled the demigods beneath his feet on the battlefield, the way a mad elephant tramples hollow bamboo in the forest. So, we get more information about how powerful Vritasura is. The earth is trembling and he tramples the demigods doesn't have to fight with them. He just walks over them and crushes them under his feet. So he's so big and so powerful. And the, these demigods, they don't have a chance to overcome and to resist him. So Sukadeva Goswami gives the example. He says, just like a mad elephant tramples bamboo in the forest tramples hollow bamboo in the forest. So elephants, of course, are very powerful, very heavy. And so, but if they stamp on a, a log of bamboo, a, a hollow piece of bamboo, they're going to go through it. So in the same way, Vritasura is so powerful. He tramples on the earth and the demigods below him, on his, below his feet, they're just trampled, they're just crushed to, to dust. So this unfortunate position of the demigods, they're face, facing this great demon, Vritasura, and we'll see how Indra deals with it. Text 9, 
Seeing Vritasura's disposition, Indra, the king of heaven, became intolerant and threw at him one of his great clubs, which are extremely difficult to counteract. However, as the club flew towards him, Vritasura easily caught it with his left hand. So, the Vritasura is so powerful, we can't, you know, just to try to compare the king of the demigods, Indra. Now, Indra is not a weakling. He's a very powerful person. He's taken on the responsibility as the king of heaven. Under the direction of great souls like Narada and others, that they encouraged Indra take this position. He's given that position because of his qualification. So he's a powerful person and he has weapons. In addition to the thunderbolt weapon, he has also some club which he can throw and which can shatter the hearts of people. Sometimes he will just throw the club and it will just kill people. And of course, sometimes the people like uh, Duryodhana and Bhima, they will fight with clubs. At the end of the Kurukshetra war, it will be a great battle between uh, grandfather, between uh, a great battle between Vritasura and Indra. So Indra, he didn't use the thunderbolt weapon. Somehow he has some doubts about the power of, although, although he'd been told that that thunderbolt weapon made from the bones of Dedici could kill Vritasura, Indra was reluctant to use the thunderbolt weapon. He may, may have had some doubts about the potency of the weapon. But anyway, Indra threw this club at Vritasura. And Vritasura just caught it with his left hand. So usually, of course, we do things with our right hand. People who are more, uh, who are right-handed, you know, generally it's the right hand we want to use, you catch things and so on. But this time, Vritasura caught this, this club with his left hand. And he, it wasn't a great strain for him. It, it was, although it's described here that this club which was thrown by Indra was actually very difficult to counteract. But still, for Vritasura, it was easy thing for him to do. He could easily throw, easily catch it. And then, once he caught that club, then Vritasura caught hold of Indra's elephant and he beat the head of Indra's elephant with that club. And when he beat the elephant with that club, it made a tumultuous sound on the battlefield. I remember the, 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 the demigods and the demons were on the battlefield, they were at war with each other. And so Vritasura is fighting and Indra is there to challenge Vritasura. So Indra threw the club and Vritasura caught it, and then Vritasura comes with the club, and he uses that club to beat the head of Indra's elephant. And not only does he beat the head of Indra's elephant, but he did some other things. He, he, he beat the, the, the club, 
the, 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 the banking system which was there for Indra and for the demigods. Uh, Vritasura has hit the elephant, Indra's elephant, Airavata, with that club. And when he beat the elephant with the club, it made a tumultuous sound heard by everyone on the battlefield. And all the people on the battlefield waiting to fight, when they heard the sound, all the soldiers on both sides, they glorified, they glorified this, uh, the Indra. Or rather, they glorified Vritasura because it's Vritasura who did the wonderful thing. He caught the club and then he used the club to beat Indra's elephant. So it was unheard of, somebody catching Indra's club and then using it against Indra and against his vehicle because Indra was riding on Airavata, the elephant. And this Vritasura takes the club and he beats Airavata with that club. Not only did he beat him, but as we hear in text number 11, that he struck the elephant, he struck Airavata, and the elephant was in pain and he was spitting blood from his broken mouth. And he got pushed back a distance of 14 yards. And it said, in great distress, the elephant fell with Indra on his back. So this is the plight of the demigods, that they were depending on Indra, and Indra's on his great elephant, and they thought, Nobody can stop them, nobody can overcome them. But here is Vritasura and he's struck, he's, he's injured Airavata and he's knocked him back 14 yards. 14 yards, that's quite a distance, you know. You just measure out, four, one pace is about one yard. So 14 full paces is the distance, how far? He pushed that, this elephant, Aravata, back. All right, so then the chapter continues, text number 12. Indra's carrier fatigued, injured, and he saw Indra morose because his carrier had been harmed in that way. The great soul, Vidrasura, followed religious principles and he refrained from again striking Indra with the club. Now he could have, because his, Indra had thrown the club at Vritasura and Vritasura had caught it and he could have hit, he could have hit Indra back with it, but he didn't hit Indra, he just hit the elephant. And so after he did it, then he waited, he stopped fighting, he waited for Indra to get back the club. And while he was waiting, that gave Indra an opportunity to uh, help Airavata to overcome his injury. Because Airavata had been hit by the club, by Vritasura, and so his whole mouth was broken and bleeding. So Indra touched the elephant with his nectar-producing hand, thus relieving the animal's pain and curing, and curing its injuries. Then the elephant and Indra both stood silently. <laughs> so the elephant and Indra had been somewhat humiliated, embarrassed, they were embarrassed by the, this defeat by Vritasura. 
they'd never been defeated before. Indra was always so powerful, he could defeat everyone in the universe. But here is Vritasura, and Vritasura is giving him a chance. Indra threw the club and Vritasura just caught it with his hand and then came back with it and hit, hit Airavata with it. So much so he injured Airavata and they, uh, they fell down, Indra and Airavata both fell because Indra is riding on the back of Airavata. So Indra is certainly in trouble. But he hasn't used the thunderbolt weapon yet. He has it in his hand, but he's reluctant to use it. So we'll hear why. Text 13. When the great hero Vritrasura saw Indra, his enemy, the killer of his brother, standing before him with a thunderbolt in his hand, desiring to fight, Vritasura remembered how Indra had cruelly killed his brother. Thinking of Indra's sinful activities, he became mad with lamentation and forgetfulness. Laughing sarcastically, he spoke as follows. So Vritasura is remembering what Indra had done. Indra had killed his brother. It, actually, the brother, Vishwar, Vritasura's brother was Vishwarup, and Vishwarup had been made the guru of the demigods. But Indra killed him because Indra saw that although he was the guru, meant to be the guru of the demigods, he was taking advantage and offering oblations for the sight of the demons. So Indra killed him by cutting off his three heads and Vritasura is very angry about this and he's, he wants to remind Indra how he did this. It was a terrible thing to do, it's a shameless thing to kill your own guru. So uh, Indra is being reminded of all this by Vritasura. Vritasura knows everything that happened. He knows the different issues which are there. He knows about the killing of Vishwarup, and he knows about who's meant to live in the ashram and who's not to live in the ashram. He knows who's been following religious principles. I mean, he knows Who's ready to go back to Godhead? Indra, uh, Indra doesn't know these things. Indra's not so much aware of these things, but Vritasura is aware of it. Vritasura wants to go back to Godhead, but Indra, his thinking is he just wants the kingdom. He just wants to have his position as the king of the demigods. So text 14, Vritasura continues describing the atrocities which Indra had done. He said, he who has killed a Brahmana, he killed, he killed Vritasura. Uh, rather he killed, uh, not Vritasura, but he killed the brother of Vritasura. What's the name again? The brother of Vritasura? Vishwarupa. Vishwarup. Thank you, Prabhu. So Vishwarup was a Brahmana and he is and he was the guru of the demigods and he was killed by Indra. He's so he Vishwarup said uh, Vritasura said, He has killed my brother. And now, by good fortune, he's standing before me face to face as my enemy. So, in, uh, Vritasura continues, O oh, most abominable one, when I pierce your stone-like heart with my trident, I shall be freed from my debt to my brother. 
Vritasura had a debt. His father had created him to get revenge on Indra because Indra had killed Vishwarup. So Vritasura is meant to kill Indra. But it's not so straightforward. There's many issues. Because Vritasura, uh, rather Indra, is a king of the demigods. And so he's a devotee. Even though he's not a pure devotee, he does have a big position in the universe. So text 15 goes on. Indra, uh, Vritasura speaking, and he's describing the mentality of Indra. He said, only for the sake of living in the heavenly planets, you killed my elder brother, a self-realized, sinless, qualified Brahmana who had been appointed your chief priest. He was your spiritual master, but although you entrusted him with the performance of your sacrifice, you later mercilessly severed his heads from his body, the way one butchers an animal. So this is Vritasura addressing Indra, and he's telling him, what he thinks of the activities of Indra. And he said, he said to Indra, he said, only for the sake of living in the heavenly planets. In other words, Indra was attached to living in the heavenly planets. He was actually, in, he actually enjoys the opulence there. Not only the opulent environment, but also the heavenly ladies who are there. Who also, the heavenly ladies, they satisfy the senses of Indra while he's there. So, Vritasura describes about the qualities of Vishwarup, his brother. He said he was self-realized. In other words, he knew he was not the body, he was the soul. And he was sinless. He didn't do any harm to other living entities. He was a qualified Brahmana. He was qualified in the sense that he had studied the scriptures and he learned the different Brahminical arts. So that was why he'd been appointed the chief priest. He was appointed by the demigods because he knew the mantras and they wanted somebody who knew the mantras to chant the mantras for the benefit of all the demigods. So Vishwarup reminds Indra that you gave my brother the job to do the sacrifice on behalf of the demigods, but then you cut off his heads like an animal. So what kind of behavior is that? And this way, Vritasura, he's, remind, he's reminding Indra how cruel and how hard-hearted Indra is. And Indra, of course, in this age, who is Indra? Well, he's the king of heaven, but also he, he, he's got a lot it's got pious activities and he's meant to help in the service of the Lord. He's meant to arrange for the different programs to go on. So it's always difficult to take on a position of responsibility. Even on this world, on the material world, it's difficult to have a responsibility for others. So what to speak of Indra, the king of heaven, that he's taken on a responsibility of ruling 
the heavenly planets. And it, he has to maintain also the cows, he has to make sure the cows are taken care of, he has to make sure the temples are nicely maintained and the ashrams are kept clean and peaceful. So many duties are there. You want to be, you want a big position, it's not that you just sit back and relax. If you become Indra, the king of heaven, you have to be there, so many functions. Just like we're seeing here in Mayapur, how the, the leaders like Srila Jagpataka Swami Maharaj and Gopal Krishna Maharaj and Radnath Maharaj, how they have to be at every program, they have to be there, they have to listen to the different lectures, sometimes they have to give the lectures. So it must get very monotonous and boring for them sometimes. But somebody has to do it. You have to, you have to do these things. It, it's not easy to take on that kind of responsibility. In the Ramayana, Tosi does, uh, no, uh, Valmiki mentions about how there are three duties which one should be very cautious about accepting because they carry with them a heavy responsibility. One of the duties is to maintain deities, to look after the deities. Another duty is to maintain cows and to look after the cows and make sure the cows are properly taken care of. And the third thing is to look after devotees or ashrams and make sure they're also properly situated with nice amenities. So here uh, Indra is being condemned because he didn't take care. He didn't, he didn't take care of his own guru. He came and killed his own guru. It's unthinkable. To kill, to kill a brahmana is one thing, but to kill your own guru, that's going very far, very bad. So, text 16, you can see Vritasura describing what he thinks of Indra. He said, you are bereft of all shame, mercy, glory and good fortune. Deprived of these good qualities by the reactions of your fruitive activities, you are to be condemned even by the man-eaters, the rakshasas. And Vritasura said, now I shall pierce your body with my trident, and after you, after, and after you die with great pain, even fire will not touch you. Only the vultures will eat your body. <laughs> and so, in this way, <laughs> in this way, Vritasura is speaking to Indra, and he's warning him. What is his position? That. You haven't done anything good and you're going to have to take reactions for all the things which you have done. All right, text 17, Vritasura continues to speak to Indra and to tell Indra exactly what he thinks of him and he says, you are naturally cruel. If the other demigods unaware of my pro prowess, follow you by attacking me with raised weapons. I shall sever their heads with this sharp trident. With those heads I shall per perform a sacrifice to Bara, to Bhairava and the other leaders of the, and the other leaders of the ghosts along with their hordes. So Lord Shiva is known as Bhutanath, 
he is the, the Lord of the ghostly people. So you can see here in this verse, he said, I will, he tells, he tells Indra that I will, I will sever their heads. Their heads meaning the other demigods who have been helping at work against me. So Indra said, I will sever their heads with this trident. I will perform a sacrifice to Bhairava and the leaders of the ghosts along with their hordes. So in this way, Vritasura is exp describing what he wants to do to Indra. He's, he's telling exactly why he's so angry to Indra and why he hates Indra because Indra has done the most abominable thing. He didn't just lie, he didn't just cheat, but he actually, he actually is a murderer. He personally came and murdered Vishwarup, and he cut off his three heads. So, we come up to text 18, we get a bit more nectar here, text 18. So Vritasura tells Indra and the other demigods, he said, But if in this battle you cut off my head with your thunderbolt and kill my soldiers, O Indra, O great hero, I shall take great pleasure in offering my body to other living entities, such as jackals and vultures. I shall thus be relieved of my obligation to the reactions of my karma, and my fortune will be to receive the dust from the lotus feet of great devotees like Narada Muni. And so you can see Vritasura revealing some of his devotional nature here in this conversation. In the beginning, he was speaking very grossly and very terrifyingly, but now he's explaining how that he said, he said, you can cut off my head. Let me die. You have the thunderbolt, so use your thunderbolt, Vritasura is saying to Indra, you use your thunderbolt to cut off my head. And in this way, I'll be very happy that my body can be given to the jackals and the vultures. The jackals eat by now, night, and the vultures eat in the daytime. So in the day and the night, his body can be eaten by these different creatures. And Vrita, uh, Vrita Sura is not worried about it because he's not attached to the body. He knows the body is not him. He knows this body is just simply a dress of his real self. So he tells Vrita, he tells Indra, he said, I will be very happy if you kill me. Why? Because I'll be free of the reactions of my karma. Right? From Srimad Bhagavatam, you know the verse, Tate nukampam sushamikshamana punjana evatma kritam vipakam Right, the, the demi, uh, rather Vritasura is describing that I will tolerate, I will tolerate all the, uh, uh, if you kill me, I will, I will tolerate it. I will take it as the reactions of my karma. 
So the verse I quoted is a prayer by Lord Brahma, which is given in the tenth canto Srimad Bhagavatam. And Lord Brahma is describing about the different verses in the tenth canto, glorifying the Supreme Lord. And he, he's praying that let me die and, and let whatever reactions come on me, let me suffer for them. That is the thinking of a devotee. A devotee thinks whenever things go wrong for him, he thinks, I deserve it, I, it's my karma. But let me go on with my devotional service. So that is, that is the criterion for the devotee. That he should go on. He shouldn't give up. Even though the going gets tough, even though the conditions may be bad, you may be struggling, but you should continue to serve Krishna. You shouldn't give up. Your devote, just because things are not going the way you want, just because you're having difficulties. But we accept the difficulties and go on with our devotional service. We go on hearing and chanting and trying to serve the Lord. So that mood should be there. And Vrita Sura is saying, let me die, let it be the reactions of my karma. Okay, not a problem, I deserve it. And let me get the dust, I, I will, when you kill me, I will get the dust from the feet of great devotees, like Narada Muni. And so this is something which will be explained later on, that Vritasura, in his previous life, he had been the king of the Vijadharas, and he was King Chitraketu. But somehow he, he got, by, a, in, a, by result of a misunderstanding with the wife of Lord Shiva, Chitraketu Maharaj was cursed that he should become a demon. And he, the result was he was born as Vritasura. But although he took birth in the body of a demon, he did not lose his devotional qualities. That the, 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 his good devotional qualities were still there with him, although he was in the body of a demon. And although he's fighting against the demigods, he's still a devotee. And he's, he's going to, you'll hear how he, he explains the importance of fighting according to religious principles. And that means don't be attached. In other words, fight is karma yoga. You do your duty. Karma yoga means work with detachment. You offer the results for the Lord. That is the mood of karma yoga. You don't think that the results are for me, but you want to offer the results to other, to the Lord. Right? In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes karma yoga. Right? What's a verse? Who knows a verse in Bhagavad Gita describing karma yoga? Karma yeah. Yes, that's one verse. You know another verse? Yeah. Yes, good. Okay. Those are two good verses for karma yoga. Very nice. Mm-hmm. So this is the mood, karma yoga means detached work. And so, Vritasura is telling Indra that if you kill me, it will be my good fortune, because I will get the dust from the feet of great devotees like Narada Muni. So Prabhupada explains in the purport about this, the importance of getting the dust from the devotees. He quotes Naratam Das Thakur, Echai Gosaiya Mui Taradas, Tansabada Pararenu Mora Pankagras. Translation, I am the servant of the six Goswamis, and the dust of their lotus feet provides my five kinds of foodstuff. Huh. Padarenu, the dust from the feet, is pancha grath. 
mora panka grass, five kinds of food. So a Vaishnava always desires the dust of the lotus feet of previous, previous acharyas and Vaishnavas. But somehow it's not easy to get the dust from the feet of the Vaishnavas. Just like Srila Prabhupada, sometimes he would come and the Prabhupada's servant would say, nobody should touch Prabhupada's feet. So, you'd be, you know, you got the restriction, Prabhupada didn't want people touching his feet. But sometimes you cannot avoid it. And Prabhupada also writes about that. In some places he says, you just have to tolerate it, although we don't want it, you have to tolerate it and pray to Krishna to protect you. Because to be touched, for other people to touch your feet, they're going to give you their karma. You have to take their karma. So you have to pray to Krishna. If people touch your feet, you have to pray to Krishna to protect you. Though that's why people always want to get the dust from the feet of the previous acharyas. The dust of the feet are so powerful the dust of the lotus feet of the previous acharyas can give us all of their good qualities. Take the dust from the feet. It said where Chaitanya Mahaprabhu used to walk, people would come and dig up the ground and they would take the, they would take the ground, the, the, all the, the earth and the ground from wherever Chaitanya Mahaprabhu walked. So, However, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Prabhupada had also spoken about this and he said, do you think you have the right to touch the feet of great devotees? Is it your right? Do you think you have a qualification to touch a person's feet? And Prabhupada also explained, he said, no one should touch the feet without being an initiated devotee who is strictly following the principles. Because if you're not initiated and you're not following strictly, it means you've got karma. And you touch the feet of a devotee, you simply give them your karma. But if you're a devotee, if you're in good standing, and you may be a disciple of the Guru, then the Guru may allow you to touch his feet. The Guru may allow it. But, we shouldn't think, it's my right. Rather, we should be very careful about that. So sometimes people have that, you know, we see people come and they want to touch the feet of the devotees. We should be very cautious about it. We shouldn't allow it. But still, it doesn't take away the fact that the dust of the feet of great devotees is very powerful. And if you can get that, but what does it mean to get the dust of the feet? It's not just a physical thing that you take the dust, but what it actually means is that you take service, you take up the mood of service in the line of the previous acharyas. Just like Srila Prabhupada said one time, I think it was in London, uh, we had Prabhupada's shoes on the Vyasa San, just at the, beside the Vyasa San. So Prabhupada said, he said, rather than touch my feet, it will be better if you bring me my slippers. He said, you'll get more benefit by bringing me my slippers rather than just coming and touching my feet. So that's an important point to be understood. So Prabhupada was explaining, you do service for the previous acharyas. That is better than just simply touching the dust, taking the dust from their feet. But if you actually do some service for them and help them and to distribute Krishna consciousness, then that is the real mercy. That is the real dust from the feet of the devotees, to be engaged in their service. Not just simply come and touch the dust, 
take the dust and then go on and do all sinful activities again. That is very bad. If we think because we got the dust from the feet of the devotee, now I can do all nonsense, then that's very bad, very wrong. We have to be very careful about that. All right, so Vrita Sura is explaining, uh, Vrit, uh, Prabhupada's explaining the position here. He said, Vrita Sura was certain that he wanted, that or he was certain that he would be killed in the battle with Indra because this was the, the desire of Lord Krishna. He was prepared for death. Indra, Vrita Sura was prepared for death because he knew that after his death, he was destined to go home back to Godhead. This is a great destination and it is achieved by the grace of a Vaishnava. Chariya Vaishnava Seva Naista Paichi Keba. No one has ever gone back to Godhead without being favoured by a Vaishnava. In this verse, therefore, we find the words, we find the words, manas, 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 vina, manas vinam padaraja prapatsye. I shall receive the dust of the lotus feet of great devotees. The word manas vinam refers to great devotees who always think of Krishna. They are always peaceful thinking of Krishna and therefore they are called Dira. The best example of such a devotee is Narada Muni. If one receives the dust of the lotus feet of a Manasvi, a great devotee, he certainly returns home, back to Godhead. So how do you get the dust from the feet of a great devotee? Of course, we have to get it. We have to earn it by our service. It is not you just come and grab the feet of the devotee and take the dust. That is not the process. But you have to earn the dust of the, by pleasing them, by service. Then you were qualified for the dust from the feet of the Lord. No other way. So this is a, an important point, often not understood by devotees. Even devotees often become bewildered by this. We think we, we we get the dust, we touch the feet, and then we go off and do nonsense. And so they think, well, I've got the dust from the feet of the great devotee. I'm liberated. I'm going to go back to Godhead. No, it doesn't give us the right to do all nonsense activities. We must be very careful. It's an opportunity for us to go back to Godhead, but we have to be very careful to keep up the standard and not to deviate from the standards. Okay, are there any questions on this point? Anyone? Have you, have you ever touched the feet of a great devotee, Prabhu? Maharaj, I have another doubt. You have a doubt? Yeah, here in the 15th sloka, Maharaj, uh, here that his heads, the plural was used. Where was it? Where is this? Uh, 15th sloka, Maharaj, text 15. Text 15, okay. Yeah, yeah. last line in the translation. Uh-huh. Rutrasa, uh, Vishwaru has his, his heads, here in a severed his heads. Yes. Translation, last line. Yes, well, he had three heads. Oh. 
Vishwarup had three heads, remember? Yeah. That's why it's Thank plural. You. He severed his heads from his body. Yeah, he had three heads. He was not an ordinary person, <laughs> obviously. He had three heads. Anyway, that's why it's plural. But it was explained that he did have three heads. One was drinking wine, one was drinking somaras, and, yeah. and one other. I can't remember what the other one was doing. Mm -hmm. Yes? So did you touch the feet of any great devotees? No. I'm trying to follow. You're trying to follow. Well, even we don't touch the feet, we can take the dust which they walked on. Where they walk, you can pick up the dust behind, take up the dust from where they walked. That's as good as it, the dust from their feet, because they walked over that earth. So you can take that earth. Oh, yeah? Yes, Prabhu has a question, Pada Seva, is it? Yes, Maharaj. <clears throat> uh, in uh, fifth canto, that uh, uh, Jada Bharat says to Rahugana that uh, taking the dust means uh, you should hear from him. Duttama Sroko Gunana Bhada. I like that. Yes. Now you have to take the dust from the feet of the devotees, smear it all over your body, right? Yes, Maharaj. So, we should understand that you take the dust from the feet, from their body, and like smear it all over. To take, it means to take their mercy, to engage in their service. To please them, not to just come and take the dust and then go and do nonsense. If we want the dust, we have to be worthy of the dust from their feet. You don't want to burden them with karma. We don't want to cause them any difficulties. But if we come and take the dust from their feet and then go off and do nonsense, and then it's very bad. It's very bad for us and it's not good for the devotee whose feet you touched also. So Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati didn't like people to come and just touch his feet. And Prabhupada also sometimes would say, nobody should touch my feet because Prabhupada knew you get reactions for that. You're getting karma. So we have to be worthy. We have to be worthy of that, to touch someone's feet. Worthy means you strictly follow the regulative principles. Just like I heard, I heard when Prabhupada was in New Vrindavan, the Anna, nobody should touch my feet, nobody should touch Prabhupada's feet. But then Prabhupada told Radhanath, at that time he was a brahmachari, he said, you can touch my feet. Because Prabhupada knew this, he knew Radhanath and he knew his nature and he knew he's a very pure soul. And so he told him, you can touch my feet. But the announcement was given to the general public, nobody should touch Prabhupada's feet. So you have to be qualified. That's the point. Yes? Any other, is that, is your hand up again, Padaseva Prabhu? Is that another question? Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm learning. Okay. All right, we'll take a break. We'll have a break for 10 minutes. Hare Krishna. Ok. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going on text number 19. So Vritasura is addressing Indra and is, is saying to him, is, is it, oh, king of the demigods, in other words, Indra, since I, Vritasura, your enemy, I'm standing before you, why don't you hurl your thunderbolt at me? Although your attack upon me with your club was certainly useless, like a, a request of money from a miser, the thunderbolt you carry will not be useless. You need have no doubt about this. So Indra may be thinking that thunderbolt won't be much use because this demon is so powerful. So Indra was thinking he could better try with his club which he'd used in previous occasions in battle. So he'd always been successful with his club and it was very difficult for people to uh, counteract it. But Vritasura easily caught it and then used it to attack uh, Indra's carrier, Airavata. So here's Vritasura, he's eager to be killed because he knows that with his death he'll be relieved of that body of a demon. He has such a disgusting body and he is certainly not attached to the body, so he's eager to give up the body and he knows that when he does give up the body, then that curse which had been put on him will be ended and he will be able to go back to Godhead. And so naturally he's eager to get free of this the demon body and such a horrible, powerful, gross body. And you see a similar situation in 8th canto, Gajendra Moksha. Lord Vishnu came and he killed the crocodile. But Gajendra said, hey, why you killed him? He, gets he got free of his body, I've still got my elephant body, you should have killed me, I want to get rid of this elephant body, this dumb body. And so, of course, we're very attached to our bodies, we're thinking, well, I don't have an elephant body, and I'm not like Vritasura, I'm not like a huge gross demon. I'm a good person and my body's okay and, you know, we make excuses. But we should understand the material body for what it is. It's just blood and bones and veins and horrible things. But we spend so much time and money just to take care of the material body, just to keep us in the bondage of material existence. And of course, you, if you go to a hospital, they have all kinds of things to keep you alive, right? They'll put you in an ICU and you have to pay a lakh a day or someone lakh a day if you go in the ICU, put you in an ICU just to keep you alive. Keep you alive, but how long can they keep you alive? A few more days? Just, it's just a business, the whole hospital set up. It's just an arrangement for m making money. So Vritasura is not thinking about trying to hang on to his body. He's eager to get free of it. And he, the only way he can get free of it is with the help of Indra. And Indra has that weapon which can kill him. That that um, Rajra weapon, the thunderbolt weapon, which was made from the bones of the Dichi. <clears throat> so he's requesting Indra, just kill me. <laughs> let me get off, let me get free of this body. 
at the end of the purport, Prabhupada describes how Vrita Tsura told Indra, he said, if you want to kill me more, if you want to kill me since I am your enemy, take this opportunity, kill me. You will gain victory and I shall go back to Godhead. Your deed will be equally beneficial for both of us. Do it immediately. Why will it be beneficial for both of us? Who can answer? What will be the benefit for Indra? Because uh, Buddhas will return to the spiritual world and Indra will also be victorious in the world. Well, what, what, what good will that do for Indra though? To be victorious? Indra will regain his uh, heaven planet, heaven. Yeah, he'll keep his position as the king of heaven. He can go back to heaven and he can stay in the heavenly planets and, and enjoy the opulence of the heavenly planets. He can go on there, continue there. That's it, to keep it, he's, he's attached to that position and the comfort which is there in the heavenly planets. He's enjoying the comfort, the luxury living and the worship and everything which comes with being the king of heaven. And he wants to hold on to it. So text 20, you have Vritasura continuing to speak to Indra and he's encouraging Indra. He said, the thunderbolt you carry to kill me has been empowered by the prowess of Lord Vishnu and the strength of Dadichi's austerities. So these two things have empowered the thunderbolt, empowered that thunderbolt so that it can kill Vritasura. One is the prowess of Lord Vishnu, certainly that is very powerful. Lord Vishnu's prowess is put there into the thunderbolt and the strength of Dadichi's austerities. Lord Vishnu had told the demigods, he told Indra that Dadichi has done many years of austerities. He's very rich in austerities and those austerities were there in the bones of that thunderbolt. So this way the thunderbolt was empowered to kill Vritasura. <clears throat> Since you have come here to kill me in accordance with Lord Vishnu's order, there is no doubt that I shall be killed by the release of your thunderbolt. Lord Vishnu is sided with you, therefore your victory opulence and all good qualities are assured. Vritasura is trying to encourage Indra. He said, Lord Vishnu's order, I should be killed by your thunderbolt. Lord Vishnu has, he sided with you. <laughs> so he, Vritasura is encouraged, he wants to encourage Indra. Go ahead, you're going, to, you're going to get victory, you're going to get opulence, you want opulence, go ahead, kill me. And all good qualities are assured. Is it a fact? Will all good qualities come by killing Vritasura? What do you say? No, Maharaj. No. Why not? Because he's a devotee. Yes, he's a devotee. He's a great soul. Right? And he's the son of Twasta, he's the son of a Brahmana. So Indra, when he kills Vritasura, he has to suffer sinful reactions. That's the next, after he's killed, after he kills Vritasura, 
we read, we'll read about Indra's, how he has to deal with the sinful reactions which come on him for, for killing Vritasura. So, in the purport, Prabhupada writes, Vritasura was eager to die with the with the stroke of the thunderbolt sent by Lord Vishnu so that he could immediately return home back to Godhead. Certainly <laughs> it's it's a it's worth it, right? You give up the material body, the body of a demon like Ritasura, a big demonic body you're happy to get rid of that body. And he's especially happy because he's going to go back to Godhead. At the end of the purport, Prabhupada writes, by killing Vritasura, Indra would not actually gain. He would remain, he would remain in the material world. Vritasura, however, would go to the spiritual world. Therefore, Victory was destined for Vritasura, not for Indra. So the real victory is to get out of this material world. But Indra is not going to get out, he's going to have to stay here. People often don't realize that, you know, we, we want to get material opulence, we want to get position, we want to get success in the material world. It's all so temporary. So Vritasura is not interested in the temporary. He wants to get into the, he wants to go to the spiritual world. Text 21, by the force of the thunderbolt, I shall be freed. I shall be freed of material bondage and shall give up this body and this world of material desires. Fixing my mind upon the lotus feet of Lord Sankarshan, I shall attain the destination of such great sages as Narada Muni, just as Lord Sankarshan had said. So, Sank uh, Chitraketu, of course, was a great devotee of Lord Sankarshan. And that for, that's why Vritasura is saying that fixing my mind upon the lotus feet of Lord Sankarshan. And by fixing his mind on the, feet of, on the lotus feet of Sankarshan, he will be able to attain the destination of such great sages as Narada Muni. So, Prabhupada writes in the purport, a devotee is always ready to give up his material body, which is described here as Gramya Pasha. Gramya Pasha, the rope of material attachment. The body is not at all good. It is simply a cause of bondage to the material world. Unfortunately, even though the body is destined for destruction, fools and rascals invest all their faith in the body and are never eager to return home back to Godhead. So this is the situation we see in the material world. Everything is for the body. You walk out in the streets, you walk along a, sh a, sh a shopping street, all the stores are dedicated to the body. This for the body, shoe, feet, uh, shoes for the feet, clothes for the body, cream for the body, this for the hair, that for the nails. Oh, it, it's on and on. So many things just for the body, taking care of the body. People want to change the color of their eyes. They don't like the color of their eyes. And they've got stuff to straighten the hair. If the hair's curly, oh no, I want to have straight hair. And then people are 
they're, they've got, they're, they're fat, they're overweight, they want to lose weight, and everything is there for the body. False teeth, false eyes, false hair, so many things we'll do for the body, try to make the body perfect. But the body's material, the body is our prison uniform. Material body is our prison uniform. We don't want, we shouldn't be attached to it, we should think how to get rid of it. Not how to make it nice, not to make it look good, but how to give up, get rid of it. So Vridasura is thinking like that. And he says, I want to get the same destination as people like Narada Muni have. Okay, go ahead, text number 22. Persons who fully surrender at the lotus feet of the Personality of Godhead and always think of His lotus feet are accepted and recognized by the Lord as His own personal assistants or servants. The Lord never bestows upon such servants the brilliant opulences of the upper, lower and middle planetary systems of this material world. When one possesses material opulence in any of these three divisions of the universe, his possessions naturally increase his enmity, anxiety, mental agitation, pride and beleaguerance. Thus one grows, thus one goes through much endeavour to increase and maintain his possessions and he makes great un, and he and he suffers great unhappiness when he loses them. So Vritasura is describing <laughs> here that the Lord never gives material opulences to his devotees, to people who are his real devotees. He's not going to trouble them with all of these things. The pure devotees of the Lord certainly don't desire these kind of things because they know all the problems which come from having them. You have money, people will envy you and people will plan how to steal it from you, how to take it away and sometimes people are even killed for their money. And the family members will fight with each other to get the money. So there will be so much anxiety. You have some money, you always have to worry, maybe I'll lose it. Maybe somebody will come to try to steal it or to rob me. So, so much anxiety is there. And then you worry, oh, maybe I should invest it. But then you try to invest it, you have to, have, you'll be in so much anxiety. Maybe I'm going to lose the money, the money will become less instead of more. So in this way, anxiety will be there. So much mental agony. Pride also, we have some opulence, we have some position, we have some wealth, you have a big car, you have a big bank account, you, you feel some pride, and becoming proud, it, it's uh, one of the demonic qualities. It's certainly not a godly quality, it's a demonic quality. So we have to be very careful about these things. 
Of course, you can have opulence, but don't be attached to it. Don't be bewildered by it. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes, who knows the verse? Lord Krishna is talking about wealth and opulence. Yes, go ahead. Yes, translation. By attachment to this uh, uh, enjoyment and uh, opulence, uh, one's uh, um, uh, opposite as someone's uh, intelligence is lost. And uh, by that, the opposite as some, the Sahitmika Buddhi, one's uh, intelligence is not fixed. Samadhuna Vidyate, it is not fixed in Krishna consciousness and like that. If, yeah. Translation reads that in the minds of those who are attached to material opulence and sense gratification and who are bewildered by such things, then the resolute determination for devotional service will not take place. And Queen Kunti also speaks about these things as well. What does Queen Kunti have to say about it? Yes, right. So what does she mention? What four things? The Janma, this bath, Aishwarjan's opulence, Sutra means education, and Sri means uh, beauty. Yes. And she said those who are on the path of cultivating these things, then they will not be able to come to Krishna because Krishna is the property of who? Kinchana. Those who are... Krishna is the property of Akinchana Gochara. Those who are materially impoverished. Those who have nothing. You think you have something and then you won't be able to go to Krishna. You're thinking, I'm a rich man. You're thinking, I'm a big man. I'm an educated man. I am a beautiful man. Like, th like that. These are barriers to us going to Krishna. If we are attached to these things. It's not that you have to give them up, but don't be bewildered by them. Use them in the service of Krishna. You have some money, use it for Krishna's service. And if you're a big person, you're, you're educated or you're very charismatic, use it for the service of Krishna, to, pre to preach Krishna consciousness and to bring people to Krishna consciousness. Don't just think these things are for my comfortable living. Oh, I will live comfortably, I will have the nice home, and I will have servants, and I will live very nicely. That's not the goal. So, Lord Krishna wants to see that we are attached to his service, and we will serve Krishna in any condition. So, Vritasura said, the Lord n never bestows the opulences unto his devotees. He won't give these kind of opulences because he knows these opulences of the material world are just a source of trouble. Bring, bring so much anxiety, so much unhappiness. Prabhupada writes in the purport, Vritasura never wanted material possessions, for he knew very well the nature of such possessions. This is a, another sign of his pure devotion. He was not interested at all in these material opulences. He knew that, that these are just trouble. Some time back they did a survey 
They wanted to know about who are the happiest people in the world. Did you hear about that survey? Who do you think were the happiest people in the world? Bangladeshis. Yes, the Bangladeshi people were the happiest people. Now, they're definitely not the richest people in the world, but they're happy. They live simply and they're happy. They have their family, they live simply, they're not attached. They have nothing to be attached to. And they're happy. Here, another statement from Prabhupada's purport. A karmi's possessions are achieved as a result of karma, but those of a devotee are arranged by the Supreme Personality of Godhead just to facilitate his devotional activities. Right? What are the, what are the possessions of a devotee? What does a devotee value? Someone tell me. What possessions will a devotee have? Yes? Krishna. What? Krishna is the devotee's only possession. I'm sorry, Maharaji, your voice is not clear. I can't understand what you're saying. Uh, Lord Krishna is the only possession for the devotees. <laughs> well, I don't know if you can just say Lord Krishna is the possession of a devotee. I want to know what actual physical material possessions will a devotee have? Is it matter of devotional service? No, no, no. I, I'm talking something physical. What physical things will you keep? That is Prabhupada. The books. Yeah, you'll have a set of Prabhupada's books, I hope. What else will you have? The huh? What? Well, I hope you have a bead bag and a set of japa mala. Japa mala, bead bags. Mobile phone, Maharaj. Huh? A mobile phone. <laughs> mobile. Mobile. They're, they're a curse, mobile phones. <laughs> so much headache. What will, what will, what's the real possessions of a devotee? You have Tosi, you have a Tosi plant, you have an altar, maybe deities there to worship, like that. Tea like, you have, you have some devotee clothes. Simple things. And what, what possessions does the karmi have? Someone who is not a devotee. What will they have? Their material opulence. No, tell me. What, what is their material the, opulence? The, the, the beautiful buildings, palatial buildings, motor cars. Yeah, right. They'll have the big palatial matters. mansion and they'll have the car. And they'll have the wardrobe with all the fancy clothes. And they'll have all the bank cards for the, where they go and spend all the money. Like that. So the big difference between the devotee and the karmi, right? The devotees, well, just like, you know, especially like a sannyasi or a brahmachari, their possessions will be very less, you know? They're living simply, living in the ashram. They don't keep much. They have nothing, very little to value. And you're a householder, you have to have a bit more. But especially sannyasis and brahmacharis, they minimize, but you keep very little. But the, the, the non-devotees, the karmis, you know, they, they're always trying to increase more cars, more clothes, more houses. One apartment's not enough, one house in the city, another house at the beach for the weekend, another place for the holiday, maybe we go home and, and so many houses. 
So big difference. Devotees, they don't they don't keep they don't keep material possessions for to, for to, for their sense gratification. Whatever they have, it's for the service for their service in Krishna consciousness. So you cannot compare the possessions of a devotee to the possessions of a karmi. Okay. Okay, text 23. O Lord, the Supreme Personality of Godhead forbids the devotee, forbids his devotees to endeavor uselessly for religion, economic development and sense gratification. O Indra, one can thus infer how kind the Lord is. Such mercy is obtainable only by unalloyed devotees, not by persons who aspire for material gains. All right. The, the real mercy of the Lord is given to his pure devotees. And who are the pure devotees? Those who don't have any material desire. They're not worshipping the Lord. Now, is Indra a pure devotee? Is Indra, yeah. huh? Is Indra a pure devotee? No, my Lord. No, of course he's not a pure devotee. Why not? He was focusing to gain physical desires. Yeah, he wants to keep his seat. He wants to keep his position as the king of heaven. He's attached. He's a devotee, but he's a mixed devotee. He's got material desires. What about Vritasura? Is he a pure devotee? Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Although he's in the body of a demon, he's a pure devotee. Why? He wants to go back to Godhead. Yeah, he only wants devotional service. He wants Sir, he wants the association of the pure devotees. Prabhupada writes in the purport there, 23, the special mercy for the unallied devotee is that the Lord saves him from hard labor to achieve the results of religion, economic development and sense gratification. Right? If you want to know what is the special mercy of Krishna, he saves us from the hard work which is required to get economic development and sense gratification. But Prabhupada then said, of course, if one wants such benefits, the Lord certainly awards them. Indra, for example, although a devotee was not much interested in release from material bondage. Instead, he desired sense gratification and a high standard of material happiness in the heavenly planets. <laughs> And so if you have those kind of desires, Krishna can fulfill, he can give you those things. But that, that, is, it's being, that is just stupidity to desire these things. You want material wealth and opulence, it's just stupidity. They just, it will just bring you trouble and anxiety and so many problems. What we should want is to get freed from material existence, freed from material life. So Lord Krishna gives special mercy to some devotees. Now text 24. 
O oh my Lord, O oh Supreme Personality of Godhead, will I again be able to be a servant of your eternal servants who find shelter only at your lotus feet? And Prabhupada explains what, what, it, what this means. O oh Lord of my life, may I again become their servant so that my mind may always think of your transcendental attributes. My words always glorify those attributes and my body always engage in the loving service of your Lordship. All right? And Prabhupada explains there in the purport what it means to be the servant of the servant. At the end of the purport he says, under his direction, one must then engage one's three propensities, the body, the mind and words. The body should be engaged in physical activities under the order of the master. The mind should always think of Krishna incessantly and one's words should be engaged in preaching the glories of the Lord. If one is thus engaged in the loving service of the Lord, one's life is successful. What it, the, that's what it means to be the servant of the servant, using body, mind and words in those different ways. Text 25, O oh my Lord, Source of all opportunities, I do not desire to enjoy in Dhruvaloka the heavenly planets or the planet where Lord Brahma resides, nor do I want to be the supreme ruler of all the earthly planets on the lower planetary systems. I do not desire to be master of the powers of mystic yoga, nor do I want liberation if I have to give up your lotus feet. So the pure devotee never wants to give up the shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord. He wants to be always engaged in loving service to the Lord. That's what it means. The lotus feet means to be engaged in the service of the Lord. Twenty-six, O Lotus Eyed Lord, as baby birds that have not yet developed their wings, always look for their mother to return and feed them. As small calves ca tied with ropes await the time of milking, when they will be allowed to drink the milk of their mother, or as a morose wife whose husband is away from home, always longs for him to return and satisfy her in all respects. I always yearn for the opportunity to render direct service unto you. So three very nice examples are given there. Three examples, you have the little birds, you have the calves, and you have the wife away from her husband. So these three examples all describe how they yearn to get the association. In the same way, devotee always yearns for the opportunity to have direct service to the Lord. So those three examples are very powerful. And we should also desire like that. Okay, so this is pretty much the end of the chapter. The wonderful qualities of Vritasura are described. I'll just read the final verse. O oh my Lord, my Master, I am wandering throughout this material world as a result of my fruitive activities. Therefore, I simply seek friendship in the association of your pious and enlightened devotees. My attachment to my home or to my body, wife, children and home 
is continuing by the spell of your external energy. But I wish to be attached to them no longer. Let my mind, my consciousness and everything I have be attached only to you. So this is Vritasura's wonderful qualities and he's ready to die. We will hear in the next chapter about his glorious death. Are there any questions? Uh, I have one question. Yes. That, uh, uh, that the Lord uh, gave this uh, boon to Indra that you make this iron uh, thunderbolt. But how was it known to Rutrasura? <laughs> how was it known to who? Rutrasura. Yes, mother. To Dhritarashtra? And Brutrasra, Brutra, Brutra. Oh, how, do, how is it known to Vritasura? Yes, Maharaj, yes, Maharaj. Uh, how was it known to Vritasura? Well, it must have been known that the, the word must have got around from the demigods that Indra has been given this. The, this wonderful weapon by the grace of Dadichi. The, the, the news travels. I mean, the, the different de demigods and demons would have their different spies and, you know, they, they, they would communicate with each other. And so it's, it, it was certainly known, but not told exactly how Dadichi knew this, how would that Vritasura knew this. But it, it couldn't have been a, a, such a big secret that Indra comes out with a weapon and, you know, they, they could, maybe they could even see Indra carrying this weapon. What is this? And so then they would find out what it is. They would, they would talk and they would be told that Indra's got this weapon. By the grace of the Lord. There is a verse in Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Ayudana Om Bajram. Ayudana Om Bajra. So that is there in Bhagavad Gita. So this Bajra, that is the Lord's uh, uh, opulence, Vibhuti. In that way, Yes, there is a, it is mentioned. Which chapter is it in? Chapter 10? In the 10th chapter, Maharaj. Yeah, Vibhuti Yoga, Vibhuti, right? Vibhuti Yoga. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm Bajra. Mm -hmm. um, was it among weapons I am the Bajra? Bajra, yes, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a special weapon, right? That somehow given to Indra. But how how did uh, how did it happen that uh, Vritasura knew about it? We can say uh, the there must have been some communication. It was revealed to him. May I don't know. Is he tri trikalagya? Does he know everything? He knows he's going to go back to Godhead. It seems like he knew he knew about his past life. He knew about Nara, uh, Saint Lord Sankashan. He knew about these things. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Okay, any other question? Okay, so then we'll meet next week. We'll go on to chapter 12 and 13. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Go back to Vrinda Ki Jai. Hare Krishna.